First on Channel 4, some sticky moments on tour with Julian Clary. Hello, I'm Andrew. Hello, I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 35 of... Round the Archives. We're getting good at doing this. (laughs) Almost seamless. Said it enough times. Yeah. Nothing much left over from episode 34 that I I can think of. Um, So let's crack on Mm -hmm. with the new edition. Yes. Um, So... Warren joined me on the sofa. He did, yes. Whilst you weren't here. Yes. And we had a bit of a sticky moment. Did you? Sure, let's let's hear about that now then. Okay. See you soon. (laughs) Bye-bye. Warren. Hello, darling. Welcome back to the sofa. Thank you. It's, it's you, been you, a while. It's you, you've been away for a while. Oh, yes. It's, it's all right. It's still very bouncy. Thank you very much. Um, the sofa's not bad either. We'll record this article um, just before Lisa's comes back from work, yep. and then we'll make sure we've got something hot inside you. So. Absolutely. What are you going for, a jumbo sausage I or something? I might go for a nice strip saveloy. Okay. Um, well, we have been watching Sticky Moments on tour yes. with Julian Clary. Uh, from 1990, and the episode we looked at was the one where they're shipwrecked on a desert island. I'm so glad you chose your word. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Look about wrong. But you said you hadn't seen this since the original transmission. No, I, I haven't seen no um, sticky moments no, since that, and, and which led on to the conversation we both had about Channel Four. Yeah, you? I mean we've not done much about Channel 4 stuff mm. and I wanted to do Sticky Moments um, partly to sort of redress that, that balance because 1989-1990 which is when the series runs is I think when Channel 4 really hits its stride in slightly strange light entertainment stuff doesn't it? Yeah it, I think because 82 were looking at the start of 4 aren't yeah. they? And they're sending their talent scouts out from then onwards, I think, because Channel 4 got sort of tainted to begin with, like any other, like Channel 5, wasn't it? And to a certain extent, um, BBC 2, where things started to go wrong at the beginning. Well, I remember sort of watching Channel 4 on that first day, and I was Mm. very excited that we had a new new series, uh, a new series, a new channel. Um, Which started with Countdown. Yes. I remember that. And we had the comic strip, that one on that evening was... I can remember being Five Goes Mad in Dorset, but there was a big thing in the local paper, because we both live in Dorset, and um, they filmed it in Devon. (laughs) And they were saying, what, is Dorset not good enough? But, you know, jump jump ahead now to um, the, the new decade. And as we sort of discussed... You've got things like whose line is it, is it anyway? You've got Clive Anderson talks back. Yeah, Vic, you've you've got Vic Reeves big, big night out, yeah. and you've got whose line is it anyway? Haven't we? We I just said. Oh, that. sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I said that. And um, with sticky moments, you've got Julian Clary, but you've got Paul Merton writing. Yes, it as well. Yeah, because uh, of course they, they they do quite a lot of work together. And then Paul goes on to have his own show. Yeah. And then, so there's a real Quite influx, right. it, and to me, I think, sort of watching at home, it felt like there was a new generation of sort of, sort of comedians and entertainers for us. Did it feel like to, to you? Cause oh, very much so. Um, it's almost a reworking of a, a musical and um, that kind of guys. It's very much 
watching it then i wasn't aware of it when i watched it at the time it was very much almost villa, village hall panto yeah and village hall light entertainment the animatronics dramatics have done a, a comedy because the sets look shoddy and sometimes they wobble a bit and fall down well this is but one it's... basic studio yeah um julian's assisted by the lovely hugh jelly <laughs> Which which isn't his real name, I should point that out. Um, and they can afford a few special guests yeah. every now and then. The Scottish one is remarkable for Fenella Fielding coming on Absolutely. when they're doing uh, doing Hamlet, aren't but, they? But if we look at uh, looking no, at no Macbeth, 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 sorry, looking at the list of guests we've got there. Well, we were talking about Fenella. We got Barbara Windsor. Yeah. You got Bill Oddie. You got Mike Smith. You got Nicholas Parsons. Dora Bryan. You, this is old school. Yeah. This is old school clashing with new humour. Well, um, when sort of, I first saw Julian Clary, he was doing um, the Joan Collins fan club, which yeah. is how he built himself, with Fanny the Wonder Dog. And you still feel the influence of, of Fanny here because when the contestants come on, they come on in two cardboard ships, don't That's they? Right, yes. Looking out of the portholes. And one of them's um, called Seafaring Fanny. And this is actually made by Wonder Dog Productions. Um, but, yeah, the, the uh, I love the fit with the first contestant, Judith. He just opens the door. Oh, just to see what's up there. <laughs> and she, she's sort of having trouble with her stool, isn't it? She is, Which yeah. is an immediate feed line for him to say he has trouble with his with stools. And then there's all this wonderful innuendo about like yeah. big rides at the fair and then the next contestant um he, he ends up nicknaming cutie doesn't he <laughs> yes. who seems to be very very short in comparison to julian clary and i don't know how tall julian clary is but um and this cutie chap does seem to be a bit scared doesn't he he's terrified he's a rabbit in a headline <laughs> but we have to explain though how they choose their members uh, uh, sorry, how, how they, they choose, choose their, their members? members. Yeah. How they choose? Um, how they choose their contestants? Isn't it? Well, it it just seems to be that the queue of people, sort of coming in, they appear to just pick whoever they like the look of. Like, You'll do. But as you said, they they've got a nice range of of people here. Yeah. They, they they don't just go for one type of person. They they've got what is it? Um, a, 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 a lady referred to as Super Gran. <laughs> yeah, who has no kids and no grandkids. She, she's Scottish. Only because he's Scottish. And, and she'll say, <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's a woman whose um, uh, nickname is Smelly, apparently. Yeah, which, which the audience, uh, friends of the audience, bubble her up with, don't they? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the first round is like a travel game. So it's, yeah. it's, it's just, just questions about what you do on your desert island. Like, if you came across a, a beached whale, what would you do? You know, would you try and shove it in the water yourself or ask how Prince Andrew was? Um, <laughs> what, what was Long John Silver best known for? And apparently it was his cookery book, cook, Cooking with a Crutch. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and lines about a little treasure on the beach. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> these are available on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of any official release, but um, yeah, the, the, these and by by the look of some of them, they were shown on Challenge as well because uh, oh, they, they, they the were copies mark. with yep. the, the Challenge question mark. Uh, but you get this sort of initial question and answer round, and he is very good, I think, at interacting with with the with the sort of audience members. Yeah, you said sort of. We've seen a few, and you say um, there's one where he's a bit more nervous, possibly. Mm. But this this is very much the generation game oh, um, yeah. for for a slightly less family audience, isn't yeah. it? So you can just push those boundaries, yeah. and it starts out with the outfit. You know what you're getting as soon as he walks on stage, don't you? But the the, the sort of next game is called Blow Up My Behind, which they've got a tank of water and some. So, bellows. And some model ships and some bellows, and they have to propel their ship across across the water. And the one that gets over the line, the line wins. Um, but we should just say about Hugh Jelly giving the scores as well. Yeah. And I can see a link between him and George, George Dawes yeah. on, on Shooting Stars later. Um, but yeah, th then there's a, there's a game where the answer to everything is a D. So what what comes with or without a hole? 
<laughs> it's donut. donut. Um, what D is a girl's best friend? <laughs> Which he says. Um, we won't Q- tell you what it was. QT does actually answer yeah. that. It's meant to be diamonds, but that's not what... Well, actually, the, the answer... Some of the answers are correct and some of them are, are wrong. Yeah. Deliberately. Like, what's a popular ride at the fair? David, David Dimbleby. Dimbleby. Yes. Um, what gave Doctor Who a lot of trouble? His dentures. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, um, what what was uh, Vice President Quayle's uh, nickname? <laughs> Dickhead. Dickhead. Yes. <laughs> but to be fair, he did get. Oh, she did. She get said Dick. Dick. Yes. yes. So she got. Um... Then you get the, the celebrity coming on yeah. under a sort of. Is it? Is it sort of weird sort of bell tent thing? It isn't is. It? It's it, like a Victorian bell tent. For is it for getting changed in or something? Like that, yeah. And he's like having a rummage inside. And he has it? to pull out all these clues, which include a, a tube of toothpaste, a medallion. And a, at which point I began to wince because I had this horrible. Yeah, you thought, thought it, it was my, somebody we yeah, can't talk about. Yes. Um, a record, a cracker, which is where he gets his jokes from, and a dog collar, collar with with the name Arnold on yes. it. Yes. And then you you. You remembered the name Arnold. Yeah, I've been wondering for ages what Tony Blackburn's dog's name was on yeah. the radio, and it was Arnold. Yeah, and out comes Tony Blackburn in his Hawaiian shirt, looking as though he has never aged a day. If you look at him now, yeah. Um, they get the next uh, mystery guest on, and yeah, they pull out sort of clues which include dark glasses. The suggestion is Stevie Wonder <laughs> at that point. Uh, a false beard. Yeah, a plastic surgery bill. Then, given that the fact that their legs are visible, we we did we were amused <laughs> Henry. at the fact that Lenny Henry was the next suggestion. And there's his white pair of legs. Then a copy of the Satanic oh, Verses, goodness. and and this puts it in 1990, oh, doesn't absolutely. it? As it's Selman Rushdie. But before he can be revealed, a policeman comes on and asks them to stop filming. <laughs> so yes. Um... <laughs> But then, then out comes the coconut shy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what were that? I mean, how can people not throw something at a coconut? It's not as though it's miles away. I mean, th- this is really the elimination game in three, two, one. At this point, yeah. well, there's mixtures, generation game, even uh, Cracker Jack to a certain extent. Yeah, event. yeah, I guess. Um, three, two, one, and then you're you're always going to end on a uh, a song or a play. Yeah. Um, what's this? This round is called "Get Those Nuts on the Floor." Absolutely. Are you actually any good at coconut shies? I have to no, ask. No, I'm sure they nail the bloody things <laughs> to the poles. I could never get me nuts on the floor. No. Then there's a sandcastle competition <laughs> where you have to make a reconstruction of Windsor Castle. Now, this is this is the the pastry thing from the generation game, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, what is it? You got extra points for depicting Princess Margaret having a fag, fag out, out the window. window. <laughs> And they have to talk about what they've made as well. So they basically put lumps of sand and shove some flowers in the top of them. Yeah, what was it? There's a landslide and it's <laughs> falling about, apart at the back and, and Julian can, can sympathise with it. Um, Cutie's explanation goes on about the Vikings, Vikings or something. I don't know quite where he where he gets the Vikings from. It's, a, it's just then you Followed by a lot of nervous laughter. Historically, it's, what is it you said? He, he's he, he's almost sort of sort of nervous of, of of turning his back on Julian. At, at one point, point. He, he has to pick something up and he moves to the side and bends over to pick it up. Yeah. Then, then we get the play uh, where they do a bit of actoring. Yeah. Um, what was it the lines about I'm cr- catching crabs in my underpants <laughs> and Julian has to d- play uh, Tom the cabin boy. Um, <laughs> But yes, and then then they just end up singing an old sea shanty. We're all going on a summer holiday, holiday. <laughs> which isn't really much of a sea shanty. Um, then the final final round, um, where oh the watermelon round. eating the watermelon. watermelon. So if you get a question right, you have to eat some watermelon. Each week it's a different sticky thing. So in yeah. the Scottish one, it was shortbread, which, oh, mean, they nearly choked to which death means on. that nobody can answer the question <laughs> yeah. after the questions after the second go. You know, woo <laughs> <laughs> goes the bloke. Um, yeah. So so what, what what sticky substance is found in large brown hairy nuts? Well, it's coconut milk, um, and I like because. Uh, Q 
cutie sort of falls behind at this because uh, he, he he keeps being too slow. But Julian asks him, "How big is your, your mouth? mouth?" At one point, <laughs> to which his answer is very. Then he drops a load of it on the floor. Do I have to eat that? <laughs> well, if you get the answer right, and then to signal the end of the show, there's an almighty oh, huge what? explosion. <laughs> I thought the bulb had gone in one of the lights. And the audience almost jump out of their seats, don't they? I knew it was coming, but I think even you were a bit surprised, yeah. weren't you? Yeah. But yeah, I just put uh, audience reaction. Um, and Judith eventually wins and gets some champagne. Yeah, the, the prize is our naff, aren't they? Yeah. Well, you, you don't play for the prize. You've got the consolation prize of a statuette of Fanny yeah, the, the Wonder, Wonder Dog. Dog yeah. So this is like your, your bendy bully, basically, isn't it? Um, it actually looks slightly better made than the, than a bully. <laughs> I don't know where they got the, the money from to do it. Um, but then then, uh, then you get another song at the yeah, end, um, which is uh, what we quoted earlier. Mm. Um it's a sort of sea shanty thing, and I like the skull and crossbones that comes down in the background, slightly wonkily. Uh, it's so, very, it's very Anne Dran, isn't well, it? Well, that, that, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Like somebody's just lowered it on a rope, and, 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 that, and that's it. Um, but I, I really, yeah, I really like that. Yes, and um, I, I will admit, I watched this one several times because I w- watched it as preparation to okay. see. If it, you know, if it was worth talking about, I soon decided that it was. Yeah. Then I watched it again, and this is about the third time I've seen oh, right. seen it in a couple of weeks. Now you sent me the link. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance. No, I, no, I, I, I didn't know whether you sort of five minutes, whether you'd seen it or not. I was in and out stuff at the time. Yeah. You were. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you also have to watch out for the camera on several occasions, yes. don't yeah. you? Uh, during the song, one of the cameras draws back, and I noticed it because we looked at some of the other episodes. And um, when they do, especially the song stuff, mm. um, they're not afraid of showing the camera. Not at all. Uh, it's it's literally a we're not cutting. Yeah. The only time we will cut is when we go to commercial. And you get this in Vic Rees Big Night Out yeah. as well. You see the camera quite you a lot. Just keep going. There, you? There's no attempt to present an illusion or anything no. like that. And this is very much that was the week that was, wasn't yeah. it? Where you you'd have that so so yeah i mean just 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 going back to these is it's been it's been <laughs> lovely and um yeah i think i'm gonna see to see a few more yeah so. I will, yeah yeah and as you said we don't do enough channel four do we? no we should we should do i mean i four. i have wanted to do victory's big night out but i've almost so, been oh, yes. been afraid of doing it because i give it the justice that i, it I deserves, don't think we can do, it? do it yeah. enough but sort of laying the groundwork here with with sticky moments yeah. i think i think is very good so yeah we'll we'll say thank you now and yes, we'll, you. we'll go off and get you your jumbo sausage shall we bye 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 Many thanks to Warren for joining me. Yes, thank you, Warren. Please come back soon. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Now, uh, we take safety very seriously we do, here yes. at, around the archives yes, we towers. Are very safety conscious. In fact, it's not even a tower because you no, could fall off a tower. You could fall off a tower and hurt yourself. Or, or throw um, your fag packet pet wrapping off, off your tower like Van der Volt does. Yeah, yeah, it's very naughty. Yeah. So, Paul and Nick now mm-hmm. we'll look at some public information films yes which may scare you i probably will Ooh. hello round the archives listeners it's me paul the shy yeti and nick nick the, the nick goodman reasonably, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, they're not particularly shy at all person no, is, yeah. uh, we're here to well we're doing something a bit different we're not doing a tv program exactly we're well nick you explain well i thought because we've had some light comedies of late um and i thought we'd i uh, um i thought thought it'd be a good idea if we did some of the um public information films because they were a huge part of uh childhood and and quite a few most of them are available now 
Um, here's two. One I don't remember from originally, but it's got a lot of significant people in it. And the other is one that scared the heebie-jeebies out of me uh, when I w- caught it on television in 1979. Uh, and it's, I've since discovered what it is and the fact that it's probably the most infamous of all the, and scary of all the public information films. But we'll come to that later. I have actually mentioned it on a past Yeti. Um, so I was either Yeti or RTA. I, I forget which one. But um, yeah, we're going to have a look at this now. There's quite a few familiar faces in it. And um, and we're going to come back to you with our thoughts. Okie dokie. Um, I'll probably be seeing these for the first time, possibly. Press, press play. Press play. How are we going to begin? So we've just watched Drive Carefully, Darling. From 1975. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I picked it because it was a bit longer than some of the others. And... Um, it's got a lot of familiar faces in it. They've um, well, I said they've, they've, I, I'd say they chucked in terms of Colin Baker. They chucked star power at it because he was big in the brothers at the time. Um, with um, in this stage of his career, he has a kind of a, a porn star, with a very seventies moustache. <laughs> and uh, there's Christopher Owen from Meg Class without his pricks. I'm going to I'm going to say that because I know uh, Andrew and Lisa like like that comment before. Um, but no, there's, so you, effectively you've got Doctor Who, a future Doctor, surrounded by two future foes. Because uh, John Chalice, who's of course a great friend of uh, um, RTA, um, is there as part of an RTA. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, yes, he's he's good um, d- doing sort of wide boy with a with a with a few bits of camp. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So so that to give the premise, you, you're seeing the. Um somebody driving to work but um the the colin and uh, the the other two are were inside the driver's head aren't they they're kind yeah, of yeah they're, they're the brain the egos and i can't remember what christopher Owen was i think he's the uh i don't know what he is but <laughs> he's kind of the, the 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 sort of the judgment part of it you know the the, the sensible one um and, and they're sort of commenting and, and encouraging or discouraging the driver um, to make certain decisions. Yeah. Um, you, you were saying it, it's quite a similar idea to um, uh, everything you want to know about sex but afraid to ask. Well, yeah, one, one of the segments of that, which is sort of about sperms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, except that, yeah, <laughs> that the, which is around, I guess, around the s- similar sort of time. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and then you also see the wife and the children sort of intercut with the drive the driving and there are quite a lot of you know near misses yeah. and um it's all quite it's, it's, very, it's sort of cleverly done interesting um interestingly done yeah um, it's quite you know some of those films are actually shot in a way that's actually quite frightening re- realistic at some point you know and uh it's strangely heightened by the these kind of three characters that make up the brain that's actually the sort of white coat like laboratory kind of scientists um, commentating on it and Colin actually conveys some of the the sort of of it quite quite well yeah because he gets to be in the final couple of minutes where the or the ego and whatever the other character was has gone and only the sort of uh, he's there sort of trying to get the the, the body to respond um, yeah this is actually um, just in case you're wondering this is actually from a uh, DVD the volume 4 of the uh, public information films uh, Stop Look and Listen so which our next one is also from so but yes it, 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 look, we were trying to work out weren't we uh, who would actually see it because it well, at well, um, sort of 20 or so minutes it's, it's a bit long for um, you know, just to be jammed between two shows on, on be, telly. So, but they always shown on TV. It wasn't like at a show before a film or in between. A Why? Film I'm, I'm, I'd rather think it must have been because some of the uh, they did have public information films on um, to, uh, in between uh, films sometimes, or, or really weird films as well. Just sort of short ones, just mm. to uh, as a run in. Don't seem to do that these days. Um, I remember years, this is going off at a tangent a bit, but I remember years, uh, in about 1980, I, there was a short film before I went to see The London Connection, 
and um, it's it. I've never heard it referenced bef- before or since, but it's a, t- a two-hander, a comedy two-hander with Eric Morecambe and Tom Baker hmm. playing dueling kind of um, Sinajo de Bergerac characters, um, hmm. and, and they're, they're, they're sort of just a two a two the hand there with, with them, them two and I, I've never heard it re- mes- mentioned <laughs> um, again or before so. but anyway yes um, it, it was a, a different sort of way of doing the uh, yeah um, quite you can almost imagine it um, you know, it sort of seems quite contemporary in a way quite cle- clever and sort of um, I, I hesitate to say almost too clever but only um, because you never know who your audience is, and whether you know when, when they when it gets kind of as a, a sort of beyond just the basic. This is it. Yeah. You know, this is what you should do. Yeah. Whether some people are even paying attention, but um, but on the other hand, it does, if those these sort of films, um, if they if they get the sort of more thoughtful people, it does stick in. In your mind, so uh, dear old. Uh, the beginning part is is introduced by dear old Frankie Boff. Oh yes, with the same ghastly hairdo as he is that for you. Uh, he's he's uh, still alive, isn't he? He's still yeah, I think so. And um, I think he was reading the uh, reading the lines off something because his eyes kept going yes. sideways. What's weird with, though is if he was reading from an auto cue, when he comes to the end of it, his 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 eyes just go straight down uh, as <laughs> if. As if everything's sort of uh, the last bit is right <laughs> to the <laughs> maybe bottom. The, <laughs> maybe the lines were being um, uh, were written on the back of some tortoises that were just uh, walking slowly <laughs> past. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's an idea, if possible. Yes, but uh, no, it's just they didn't. Uh, although he was reading from an autocue, there didn't seem to be any logic to the way he was looking at it. So uh, he'd be fi- he was well. He'd look at the camera for a bit, and then his eyes would suddenly drop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I said, I said to you, is he doing a Tony Hancock thing? Thinking of the, uh, oh, yeah. the 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 blood donor, where he was yeah. reading bits of the, uh, bits of the lines, uh, which I think I think if I, I might be totally wrong, but I think when Tony Hancock um, was reading the script off things in the blood donor, it was because he'd been it maybe he'd been in a car accident and hadn't had time to learn his learn his lines. Well, I mean, he was half cut. I mean, he was he, he liked his booze quite a bit, uh, but yeah, so. right. Um, the next. The really? next film you're going to show me is Apaches. Apaches, yes. Um, ooh, now year, years ago, about seventy nine, um, I caught this on a on the farming program, which is always and probably still is always um, on a Sunday, mm. uh, and I just happened to be tuning in casually and seeing what was on the telly, and um, I caught. I I, I I must have just missed the beginning part because um, I clearly remember most of this, and um, I. Really, quite. I mean, it's. I suppose it's because it's. You actually see kids dying as well, mm. and the way that. Like, and they were about my age at the time uh, 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 that I was at the time. So I actually found it very disturbing. And years later, I checked on when I checked online, and I discovered what it is and the kind of place it was. It was shown, and um, sure enough, it's become. It's probably the most notorious of the. Uh, public information films. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's disturbed many, and uh, it actually gets a shout out on the uh, doc, the Doctor Who release of um, Reign of Terror because the the writer of it played a, so, a, a French soldier who gets killed in the first episode, hmm. and um, t- uh, Toby Hader actually t- asked him about Apaches because um, it, it, it he Toby too was scared of it when he was a kid, um, and uh, yeah, I've, and it's so it's. And also, it's mentioned in the Scar for Life book, which we also mentioned in mm. um, a previous um, podcast, um, which uh, Ch- Trevi recommended. And I, I firmly do too because I've got it now, and it's it's uh, it, it, it it's really is my my seventies, as it were. You know, the the, the kind of things that uh, freak me out or whatever. But um, yeah, yeah. So, we'll watch it and we'll come back and comment. See you later. In a few minutes. A few seconds, probably, actually. <laughs> well, we've just uh, watched Apaches. Yes. Uh, and um, Ooh. Well, where were their parents? I know. I, I, it, you know, But then, it, that was the 70s. You know, we played outside and for hours on end. And, um, the, you know, we we were only called in when they, they said supper. So, I, as I say, I, I, it's... 
it's still very disconcerting because you know it's that's maybe it's different in the in the current world, but it's the same sort of thing that could happen these days. I mean, the, and the whole scenario that as kids were about my age when the film was made, and I would rush, my friend and I would rush around doing things. But I don't think we because we didn't live in a rural area. We um, we were only up the road at the beaches, but but that is um, very much like my sort of yes. Child. I mean, we wouldn't play on farmyards because. There was one nearby, but there were plenty of other places to yeah. to play. Um, but the thing is, we were still, you know, it, it, in the beaches days, we were still at the garages where mm. there were death trap cars. There were there was there was all sorts of crap that could kill you, basically. Just, and the, the fact that they don't hold back from that is actually you know, just to give a sort of summary, uh, or brief summary. It, Apache's is um, about sort of uh, to start with six kids playing. Um, mainly around a farmyard or in a quarry, and and how sort of th- th- they meet their untimely ends, um, what sort of one by one, and um, it's very sadly done as well because you see that the, there's this sort of impact on the family, and um, and they're not bad kids. They you know they just don't they have they're not really boned up to the the, the the sort of thing. And the thing is with the patches, it's it was. Not only is it sort of freaked out a generation of, um, of kids, but it's um, very. It's still in. It's still circulating. It's forty-two years on. I mean, um, we Ali went on a driving, you know, a driving safety course not ten years ago, mm. and they were still. Sh- well, actually, it, it was because I only got this about five years ago and this DVD um, and I'd showed it to her and she and they were still showing Apaches apart although it's got nothing to do with road safety they still showed it as a safety thing um, even though you know it's um, it's still considered uh, worth you know worth a watch in terms of I suppose in terms of their road safety um, uh, with something like the tractors the the, uh, adults weren't very vigilant the worst one the the worst one was the Child who fell into the um, I shouldn't laugh. Uh, the, the slurry the, pit. The slurry yeah. pit but I, I I found that very disturbing when I was a kid. You know, but, sort of because it's just like. Ugh. But also the one with the girl who drank the yes. poison, not and you don't see anything happen. You just hear you just hear the screams. Of the night screaming. Um, those those two as uh, are generally considered to be the most disturbing. Those two. as it went on, I did begin to. Uh, or I just begin to write my own version of the story and wonder whether either the parents was de- were deliberately getting rid of them or, the, <laughs> or, the, or maybe the parents had been taken over by an alien force yeah. who wanted to get rid of them. But I think it's quite because like, because in, in in child logic there's you know there's a, a, a sort of fictional canvas and um, you know the, it j- just the, it just carry on going going there you know but uh, it's a very clever script by as I say by. Um, Neville Smith of, of Reign of Terror fame and um, worth a watch if you can see it and uh, as I say it's even though it's like 40 old years old when Ali went on that course they were still said you know you, you might find it disturbing and, mm-hmm. and um, when we uh, when I was growing up there was I don't think any children died in the village but an au pair died in our village trying to rescue a dog who was swimming across the weir and the dog got out and she never did mm. um, so she she would have only been in her like, a, like 16 or 17 oh dear um, but, but uh, no it's, uh, the, the, that's the thing with, with it, it's all horribly possible and uh, weaved into a story that where it's you know there, there's 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 bits of humour in there you know with the, with the kids banter but it, it sort of all adds to a, a, a very effective a very frightening little tale. There enough, um, as I said to you at the time, there were enough disasters in that, in that in Apaches to last about six episodes six of Casualty. Six episodes of Casualty, yeah. yeah. I mean, and quite graphic episodes of Casualty. Yes. Um, um, but no, I, I've, it's um, it's still very effective. Mm. And one wonder, then none of them were, uh, were experienced actors. You know, they were all chosen from a, a junior school at the mm. time. I um, wonder what, what, what they went on to do, you mm. know. Probably all lawyers yeah. or something there. Yeah. <laughs> they never left their bedrooms because they were petrified. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've got to hand it to the, they, they they really go for it, and especially with the the, the poor lad in the the slurry pit. You, he did go in. He was he was and went under. I mean, yeah, the two. I think the, 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 two, the two that were the the two. I want to raise um, uh, a sort of 
thinking too much about it. But the, the one who got hit by the gate, I didn't look that heavy. I think that was he was trying to uh, create. Uh, attention to himself <laughs> but and the one about the boy who got on the tractor I mean those people those adults should have known after all the deaths in that village yes. in the, they should have known don't let any children near anything that was very responsible the past um, is a foreign country um, uh, yeah I mean, it, it, you know it's uh, it, also I, I I don't know my mass has never been good but um I, it wasn't there one still alive at the end. Yes, that was the one who was at the, fu- the, the, the funeral. Yeah. But though he says, "I wish I was," which implies because he's it was, dead. Oh yes, it was. Um, yes, that was what that was what I got from it was that um, it was one of the boys that was narrating. It was it was dead. Yeah, it sounds very much like something I would write. Yeah, <laughs> actually, your school teacher would tell you don't write anything, don't write any stories where the person who is telling the story is actually dead. That's but they also about. say, um, don't you know, never write a car chase. But if if you didn't, if Troy Kennedy Martin and where would the Sweeney be? Yeah, we did. Um, that's <laughs> um, and Lee, um, our friend, our mutual friend from years ago, Lee, did a, a big car chase in one he, of he, in one of did. our our had, joint stories. Had bugger all to do with the story, but you know, <laughs> it was, it was sort of he completely went off at a tangent. But he did it. He pulled yeah. it off. Um, to, but but no, uh, uh, um, directed by John McKenzie, who did The Long Good Friday a couple mm. of years later, mm. and uh, was quite a famous director. Um, but um, to, to sort of um, finish it all up, we watched a very uh, f- sort of famous but short, short one, yeah. which was w- the one I said to you. I don't know if I remember it at the time. I'm not sh- sure. I-, I think if I remember anything, it's the one with, like, the kites, going, the electricity yes, one. Yes, we've got that um, one, yes. It, um, <coughs> with, narrated by dear old um, Brian Wilde. Yeah, but the one, that I, the one that I remember, the one that I sort of like, if you can like them, because it's sort of... Uh, it appeals to my horror yeah, side. You is, can admire them. I mean. Yeah. Well, you know, I just watch it as if I'm watching yeah. a very short episode of uh, of Hammer House of Horror. Yeah, or exactly. I mean, yeah. Um, the 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 dark, dark and what's it called? Dark, dark and Lonely Waters. Yeah, yeah Lonely Waters. I think it's called. Yeah. But so, yeah, that that is extremely well done. That's the one that we got, watched. You've got Donald Pleasant on board, which is always a good idea. Yeah. That's, and so it's we're extremely that well one. shot, and there's you can just about make out Benny from the first series, first few series is a Grange Hill. Um, he, he's he's jumping up and down on the bank there, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a very famous one and and um, well known for for scaring the. I couldn't help but think because because that one's got like a hooded, like death sort of standing in the water and stuff. But yeah, right at the end when when they find. His, his sort of cow, whatever you want to call it. Um, oh yeah. Um, and they throw it in the water. I, 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 in my head, I'm kind of thinking, oh, death going, oh help save me! Oh, blah, 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 blah. I, I just like the the very overdubbed um, Anna Skrill kind of <coughs> girl at the end. Saying, oh, what an horrible thing! Oh, what's that? Oh, what's oh what's that? an horrible thing! Oh, he's in the water. Oh, that was stupid, wasn't it? <laughs> but um, but no, so, um, I, yeah, as I say, I think they're extremely. I, you know, I, I collect them because I think they're extremely well made and yeah. effective. Always, always a good. You know, were made with um, superbly with the, with the, obviously a very serious message. But from a, from you a, can a, never a, you can never um, you, these lessons are always. Just because you're, you're from fifty or forty or whatever, yeah. the, 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 you still need to be careful when you're Absolutely. out and about. I mean, uh, they, 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 most of them have got evergreen messages, or sort of. Um, or if not for you, then for, you, for the, then for your little ones who are around you. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I imagine the uh, don't go, get caught up in a mangle, or, <laughs> or don't put feed your fingers through a fax machine, uh, sort of redundant. Also, now. there was that. Um, <laughs> the, 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 there was that um, sort of false. Um, we, we, a, a near a near accident in, in Apaches, where you thought the, gu- yes, the boy was, was going to get run over by the. Um, was, there, there's some very teasy direction here and there because um, there's that, and also when the poor lad's gone into the slurry pit, yeah. as they go back into the farm, there's a there's a great big close up on a muddy pool, yeah. uh, which is kind of like <laughs> a bit of a kick in the nuts. Um, but uh, li- listeners, we, we we may be laughing, but we're not laughing. They are really effective. Yes. But uh, I think um, and they did use real kids. Yes, <laughs> who we presume went on to other things. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, they are. It, it is a good a good set, and, and, and even if it doesn't bring back uh, memories because you're you're too young, how dare you? Um, they're, they're still effective and uh, a, a product of their 
time, but still with messages that are valid today. Absolutely, as I say, there's uh, Padgett is still doing the rounds on on certain uh, safety things, um, so, uh, and the fact that they weave it into a little story, you get yeah. to, you get to know the characters, which is even more kind of disconcerting, really. Yeah, as I say, it did remind me of of, of several episodes of Casualty <laughs> that I've watched. Anyway, um, we will return. Yes, with, yes, with, with Mr. Andy. Yes, um, um, thank you for letting us talk about this, Mr. Mr. Trebian, Mr. Yeah, no. Decent. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Nick, as well. Thank you, Andrew. And, and, they still uh, have the power to cut me out. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Andrew and Lisa. <laughs> Many thanks to Paul and Nick. Yes, thank for, you, boys, for doing those. Yes. Did you? see many public information films when you were at school i must have done i don't really remember i'm sure we were shown the green cross code ones i had to cross the road safely yeah. possibly the tufty club you know the tufty ones yeah sorry the tufty club was outside of the video of the films but probably yes well i i vaguely remember at like middle school um we might have an afternoon of like Films probably because when the teachers couldn't be bothered to do anything else, <laughs> I'm sure Warren could confirm I'm sure that. He does. But there, there we mm. go. Anyway, uh, next up it's Martin Holmes mm-hmm. who's going to take a look at Survivors on BBC One. Survivors. Is there anything I can get for you or, or your woman? Food. We're very hungry. The survivors face starvation on BBC One tomorrow night at ten past eight. this is going to be a cheery piece, isn't it? For some people, Terry Nation did three rather wonderful things in his life. He created the Daleks for Doctor Who, he created Blake Seven, and somewhere between those two, he created Survivors. His reaction, it is said, to him realising how little he knew about how stuff actually worked. Born out of the crucible of the burgeoning, self-sustaining, hippie lifestyle of the late 60s, and the shortages and power cuts of the mid-1970s, and reacting to the constant images of queues at petrol stations from various oil embargoes going on at the time, Survivors is very much of its time, but also surprisingly timeless, give or take one or two obvious specific fashion and engineering issues. At times, it is a kind of dystopian version of the good life, but in a no-holds-barred, terrifying kind of a way. Survivors, or perhaps it should be referred to as Terry Nation's Survivors, at least in his head, was made over three series between 1975 and 1977. And episode one, The Fourth Horseman, written by Terry Nation and impressively directed by Pennant Roberts, is very atypical of the series of a whole, and yet makes a fascinating vision of the future all on its own. The titles are simple and and devastating to a surprisingly moving piece of apocalyptic music a bespectacled man wearing a surgeon's mask drops a flask which shatters then at an airport probably in moscow by the image of a passport stamp that appears he looks a little ill a hand flops down to the ground many more stamps bearing the names of worldwide cities appear until finally london and then the screen splurges out to a bloody red this episode is essentially the story of two women both survivors in their own way firstly we meet abby grant played by carolyn seymour a rather spoiled stay-at-home trophy wife to a busy executive initially cast very much in the here's your whiskey darling margot ledbetter mold who is mother to a son absent at boarding school later we will meet jenny richards played by ian fleming's niece lucy fleming who shares a flat with another young woman somewhere in london we're not really sure what it is that jenny does to be honest but she seems fairly well acquainted with the hospital staff when she turns up there later although that could just be because one of the doctors is having an affair with her flatmate 
Jenny, incidentally, is the only character who will survive, on screen at least, to appear in the very last episode, three seasons later. In general, Terry liked to put strong women in his dramas, though, at least until the blokes turned up and somehow took things over, including the focus of his writing. But at least he tried. At the beginning of this story, the world is very recognisable and presumably at least fam vaguely familiar to the one inhabited by its viewers, although very quickly this is about to change. Like many big stories, it starts very small, in a relatively isolated commuter village, just about as far from the centre of things as it's possible to get on the outskirts of London, and the sort of place that is usually left untouched by world events. The story starts on a tennis court, a game, I suppose, where there are winners and losers, if that's the allegory we're playing to, or maybe it's just pointing out some point or other about being healthy, and whether that makes any difference at all when the virus strikes. Or perhaps it's just a chance for the director to see Abby wearing very tight white jeans and a tight white top. It's a chilly morning, and with her hair long and carefree, she is playing against a machine, one of those automatic ball-serving thingies which is brand new, according to what she tells Mrs. Transon, her purple housecoat-wearing housekeeper, in the vast kitchen of the Grant's enormously expensive-looking house, where they have enough disposable income to have a state-of-the-art portable television in the kitchen. So far, so very middle-class suburban, in a The Brothers kind of a way. The class system is very much on show here, as another example of things about not to matter very much, as Abby is very much the posh but bored middle-class housewife with an accent that could cut glass. As we see soon find out when her son Peter rings from boarding school, which, despite the distraction of that bright yellow towel she's wearing around her shoulders, is the first troubling indication that bad things are afoot. She may have to go and fetch her son home at the end of the week if things don't improve. Already the village school is closed, and as she asks for a cold drink from Mrs. Transon, get it yourself, you lazy so-and-so, they discuss the disease as if there's a stomach bug going around and reassure each other that there's probably nothing to worry about. Mrs. Transon asks if she can go and visit her, her sister Doris who isn't answering her phone. It becomes evident that there's a big breakdown in the telephone network as Abby offers to drop her off at the station when she goes to pick up David later, although the phone jingles alarmingly to imply that something problematical is indeed occurring. Abby drives David's very posh sports car, a Jensen Interceptor no less, although such things are about to become meaningless, through the surprisingly empty streets of the village. The radio is still working and we hear music for almost the last time as the news is due on at four. She runs into the village doctor, driving his massive Rolls-Royce soon-to-be-pointless status symbol, who wants to bring some vaccine round to their house later, and mutters about how busy he is with some of his patients just trying to be fashionable by joining in with this illness fad. Abby and Mrs. Transon arrive at Brimpsfield Station, and Mrs. Transon catches her train, and whilst this shows exactly how the virus spreads, we will only catch one more final glimpse of her. Her function in the plot almost over, the common people are now represented by Blake Butler as the station master, Mr. Pollard. It's all gone apart, as he puts it. All the trains are delayed, the phone's all jammed up, timetables don't mean a thing today, and he's getting no sense from Paddington. Although why he's asking a Peruvian bear for advice is beyond me. Abby goes to make a phone call from the public call box to report the fault on the line at home, only to find that is pointless. And via the four o'clock news on her car radio, we discover that there are massive traffic jams heading out of London, and that New York has had no power for 24 hours. Tellingly, the camera pans from two young girls in an otherwise quiet station car park to a high-speed train poster, showing the heights of human technological achievement about to be snuffed out. And after that one final glimpse of Mrs. Transon on the train, we cut away from Abby for the first time to meet Jenny in her flat in London, fussing over her ill flatmate who explains through her fever about how cold she is and how worrying her lumps are. Jenny sports a terrifying tank top and a shirt with collars that would give Concord's wings a run for their money. She decides to go and get help, and whilst her flatmate plaintively pleads not to be left alone, she goes, claiming that she won't be long. Night has fallen, and Abby does not look well as she is suddenly woken from sleeping in her car by a loud knocking at the window. It's Peter Bowles playing her husband David. Oh look, finally, the star has turned up. You think it must be a Peter Bowles series because, well, he's Peter Bowles, and Abby's obviously about to snuff it so the series can finally get properly started. After all, these sorts of shows are never about the wives, are they? Poor Peter Bowles, about about to lose his abbey and become a survivor. Actually, Peter doesn't come across as being very nice at all. He burbles 
on at great length about his ghastly six or seven hour journey and how he even had to get on a bus, I ask you. Anyway, he's far too angry to be exhausted and whilst Abby discreetly checks herself for lumps and the tannoy announces considerable delays to the empty platforms, he starts another rant about nightmare traffic jams as we jump cut to Jenny crossing a road blocked by a nightmare traffic jam. In a very busy casualty department, people are queuing up to get jabs in an overwhelmed hospital. Jenny is simply told to ask at the desk by a harassed hospital employee. She meets a doctor called Andrew, who is the one who is sleeping with a flatmate, and even though Jenny runs through all of the symptoms, the fever, the lumps and so forth, Andrew finally cracks under the strain and perhaps unwisely tells her it's not flu and that the Home Secretary has ordered them to keep up the fiction to stop the panic. Seventy are dead, and that's expected to treble by the morning, and in about six days. At this point in the narrative, it's surprising to realise that only 13 minutes have passed. This story is moving at a cracking pace, especially for a series made when it was. Back at Grant Towers, David is doing a lot of reckoning as he sits in his nice suit, drinking his nice glass of whiskey and wondering where his evening meal is. More backstory unfolds. Agents in Hong Kong say millions have died in China, although that's not on the news as well as some people in Rome. And whilst Abby cooks bacon and eggs so convincingly that the fat spits in her eye, he fiddles with the now dead radio and spills the beans about having spoken to Peter about the secret plans for Abby's birthday surprise. But the apocalypse is upon them. Radio 4 cannot be found. Over his dinner, whilst Abby simply asks cheese because she's not feeling well, they discuss the millions killed by the flu epidemic after the First World War. A real world tale for those still thinking this is slightly far-fetched, I suppose. And David, probably typically, worries about the effect this might all have on his business interests. And so, as the condemned man eats his hearty evening breakfast, we pause to note that his expectation was that Abby would cook it for him. And because we're deep in the heart of the 1970s, she does this without comment. This not at all cosy domestic scene, apart from his obvious wealth, what on earth does she see in him, is punctuated by discussions about how the scientists will sort it all out in the end, and what happens when a city breaks down, and, in a poetic aside from the pen of Mr. Nation, whether a city is like a pampered baby. David expects there to be a state of emergency declared, and for the troops to be sent in, and, in a shocking display of proto-nimbyism, states that they'll be alright out there in the countryside, just as the lights go out. For Jenny, back in London, the lights also go out, and, with Dr Andrew in tow, they find that her flatmate has died alone while she was out getting help, which makes her feel guilty for a moment or three, but will be all but forgotten about as the calamity escalates. And Andrew tells her in no uncertain terms to get out of London, and that he can't because he already has the disease, and is therefore as doomed as the person he was having an affair with who they came here to fail to help. In the grim darkness, with sirens still blaring, we discover that Jenny has no symptoms, and that some people appear to have a natural immunity. In the hospital, they have only had one survivor out of hundreds of cases, and Dr. Andrew leaves with the cheery thought that the cities are going to turn into cesspits very quickly. Back at the Grant's house, it's a relatively normal bedtime, and in dreadful pyjamas, David reluctantly suggests that they might get Peter out of school, maybe later, if things get tricky. What his definition of tricky might be remains unclear, given what we've already seen and the title of the programme, but he is acting in a very human manner here, in assuming that the life they have is forever, and that things will get back to normal soon. They try to get to sleep, but Abby is starting to show signs of illness and, still keeping up the pretense, going that this is about to become the David Grant show. She's feeling hot. Night has fallen, and in a sinister cut to some shop window dummies, Jenny is walking along a dark and terrifying street in an awful coat and carrying awfully inappropriate luggage. Glass smashes, and she's harassed and threatened by three awful men to indicate the new world order and just how terrifying this world is about to get, although this time Jenny manages to run away. The only upside is that we can probably assume that this scary trio is also doomed. It's it's not a kind thought, but we appear to be, a, be beyond kindness now. Back in the vast kitchen of Grant Towers, it is the middle of the night, and a dreadfully ill Abby is at the sink, not dutifully doing David's washing up, but trying to get herself a drink of water. A glass is dropped, and David, still trying to convince us that this is his show now, and he's destined to meet up with Jenny eventually, fails to get a phone line to ring for a doctor. At the moment, Jenny looks like she might need saving too, as terrified she hides from more urban horrors. The next day, 
David intercepts his local doctor, who's leaving after yet another pointless visit. He's not looking too good himself when David meets him, and his own wife died that very afternoon, which explains the whiskey he's knocking back behind the wheel. He's not a cheery soul, despite him attempting a dark joke or two. People are dying, and there's nothing he can do. In this small microcosm of life representing the world as a whole, he's just seen an entire family die inside an hour, and he wonders if that's just one morning, what things will be like in a week. He's just very, very tired and explains to David that in a week, millions could be dead. For Jenny, still making her way along frightening urban streets that might have once looked quite pleasant, a clap of ominous thunder leads to her finding an abandoned car to sleep the night away in. Abby has spent a sweaty Monday night, and at 6.12 on a Tuesday morning, we have to assume that her alarm clock has batteries here, given the lack of power, we hear the same rainstorm that Jenny is sheltering from. Then, on a bright Saturday... At 3.29, we hear birdsong, and Abby wakes up. She has survived. With tentative calls of, David, we see that the kitchen is in the state, the fragments of the glass she once dropped is where she left it, and as she pours herself a swift gin and tonic, we see that David, Peter flipping bowls, remember, has died on the sofa as she slept. Crikey! Jenny has made it out of the city and is surprised to have a brief encounter with Talfrin Thomas in his little tent. He's playing Tom Price, an unsavoury Welsh vagrant who will come back later in the series and give it at least one of its more terrible moments. For the moment, he is simply a frightened figure imploring Jenny to stay back as they barter for rabbits, tin food and chocolate. Against a dramatic skyline, we hear from Jenny of just how bad it was in London and frightened villages who wouldn't let her in for fear of the disease that they think she might have. Tom Price is, however, something of an optimist, telling her to wait until the doctors have cleared it up and that the Yanks will have a cure. He sees a bright future with plenty of work and big money to be made, showing how people cling to the view of society they think they still have. Something that will be picked up on in a later episode when he's seen wearing posh clothes and driving a stolen Rolls Royce. This odd couple part, at least for the time being, with a cheery good luck and a warning to stay away from people. Abby is so far at least, staying with one particular and very dead person, and looks terribly sad. A look which she does very well, it must be said. She decides to go outside and, wearing a huge woolly hat, walks around the very dead-looking village that she lived in. She finds empty houses, a pointless Rolls Royce, and an angry dog. She heads to the church, where the graveyard reminds us of an earlier line about not being able to bury the dead, and prays that she's not the only one still alive. Later, back home, as she contemplates a vase full of dead flowers, whilst wearing more rings on her fingers than seems feasible, she makes a decision to try and find her son Peter, and as she drives her car along an empty road, she just misses out on meeting Jenny as, despite her hurting feet, she has run to the roadside just a little too late as she heard a car. Arriving at a massive house, which turns out to be the private school they sent their son to, she honks the car's horn, but nobody comes. In a different, but equally huge woolly hat, she walks around the abandoned school, finding dead boys still in their beds, but to her great relief, Peter is not one of the bodies. Amazingly, she sees a light burn which brings her to the rooms of Dr. Bronson, as played with quiet dignity by Peter Copley. He is dutifully monitoring a ham radio, but is shocked when she finds him as he is profoundly deaf. He tells her a tragic tale of a group, including her son, which escaped five days earlier, and that out of 300 people in the school, how he is the only one still alive. Still, Abby remains optimistic of finding Peter, and who knows, maybe he got some sort of genetic immunity from his mother. Jenny finds a man sitting by a tree with a fire it. He is barely alive, but manages to ask her to keep away. Jenny is too tired to go any further and asks if she can stay, and her new friend seems too ill and exhausted to put up any further resistance. Meanwhile, as it's getting light, Abby is having a fag, whilst Dr. Bronson fills in a lot of the backstory that he heard via his radio, with tales of the death of administration, the terrible way life got in the cities, and his musings on the biological freaks that he and Abby are. After this, his exposition is basically the philosophy for the entire series, that they must come through what is to follow and start learning again. Could any of us make a candle from scratch? Could a skilled carpenter make the tools he actually needs to work in wood? Despite the breathing space that they might have from the rapidly dwindling resources that already exist, he realises that he could possibly fashion a stone tool, and he reflects upon the irony that his generation, one that put a man on the moon, are now discussing stone tools. All must be learned again. Dr. Bronson makes for a rather tragic figure as he stands alone, facing a useless future in a tweed suit and an old school tie once his hearing aid batteries run out. Jenny, meanwhile,
meanwhile, finds that morning has come and the fire has gone out. Her companion of last night lies dead, or deadish, because he does blink, and as she has a sudden realisation in her stupid coat and with her stupid bags, she decides to scavenge what she can from him, taking the more practical bag that was serving as his pillow and finding it stuffed to the brim not with crisps and chocolate, but bundle after bundle of now worthless five pound notes. The implications are clear. Values have now changed. What once mattered a lot to some people no longer does. After a bit of rather surprising actual, if slightly, but not that slightly, blurry nudity, Abby takes a final shower in what was once her family home, metaphorically scrubbing off the past. Then, after cutting short her long hair, Abby, leaving the Jensen, loads up the practical Volvo with cans of spare petrol that she got from somewhere and uses the rest to burn down the house with most of her possessions and David's body inside. The implications are clear. Her old life is gone. The world as we know it is gone. And what with killer rats, mob rule, plague, kangaroo courts, obsessive repopulators and gangs of thugs, there is far, far worse to come. But it's only a story. Or is it? Some might suggest that with our current population growth and overstretched resources and various nutters running various parts of the world, the biological culling of humanity is only a heartbeat away and our society may very well have to face some or all of the fears that this remarkable piece of television causes us to think about. Sleep well. Many thanks to Martin. Yes, thank you, Martin. Another lovely article. That's inspired us to sort of go back and look at Survivor. It has. Well, yes. We thought we'd watch the first episode. Because yeah. we've, we've had you, you bought me Survivors for Christmas a couple of years ago. And we'd never got around to start watching it. So we, we watched the first episode. And then we decided, or I decided that it would be good if we carried on watching it. So we're up to episode three now. Yes. Um, I'm going to try and do one episode a week. Didn't you say you always used to get a cold when you watched yes, Survivors? Yes, every time I've seen Survivors in the past, i managed to develop a cold, which is very disconcerting. And also, we watched the first episode of the um, reboot from 2008, yeah. which really doesn't work as well, because it's just twice as long as the original first episode, and it takes up till about halfway through the episode for anything to really start happening. It's weird, isn't it? People say modern TV is is faster paced, yes. but this certainly wasn't. It wasn't. No. It wasn't, and because it, I think it's because it's, it's ninety minutes, so it's given them the time to de- develop it slowly, and I can sort of see where they're going. But you compare it to the the original episode, and it's all starting to happen by sort of less than a quarter of an hour into the episode. Because we were going, the lights should be going out by now, yeah. shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so and also there was weird pacing in the reboot because you don't get because it's, 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 it's effectively episode one and two of the original series put together yeah so I, I suppose it's at the point that you would get Greg Preston in the second episode that you get him in the in the longer episode but he just suddenly appears as a character and you have there's no sort of references to where he's come from but no it's you forget how much power that first episode has got the four horsemen you know I think it's possibly Terry Nation's best piece of drama yeah. that he ever wrote. So it's certainly got power to it. Certainly got, you know, makes you think. But you've also got the book. I, I've i got, yes, we already had it. We've got the Duke copy now, yes, of, of his novelisation. And you've been looking at the Big Finish I've been listening to well. the Big yeah. Finish um, audios. Um, episodes one or two of the first series which feature... Terry Malloy yeah. until as he puts it he cocks it <laughs> just before the end of uh, the uh, second episode and it is, it's actually I mean it says on the uh, in the synopsis of them that they are not suitable for younger um, members of the sort of public to listen to because they feature things that are uncomfortable and, yeah. and, and they actually take it in a quite harder direction Okay. In some ways, the television series. I think they do stuff that you probably couldn't do on the television series. Right. So, like have dogs that are scary. <laughs> so, not just licky. Not just licky. 
Yes. And we've also managed to get a hold of a copy of um, Andy Priestner's book, yes. which has been tremendously helpful. Uh-huh. So, and we've come to the opinion that Terence Dudley could have fallen out of himself given long enough. <laughs> so. Okay, is that all you got to say? Yeah, that's all we've got to say at the moment. Right. But yeah, you know, if you've never seen it, watch it because it is amazing that first episode. Now, we're releasing this in May 2019. We are, yes. Which rather explains the next mm-hmm. thing we're going it to does. do, doesn't we? Yes. So, you're going to take a look at Victoria Regina. <laughs> So, Lisa. Yes. Why should we do Victoria Regina in May 2019? We should do Victoria Regina because uh, the 24th of May 2019 mm. sees the 200th anniversary of the birth of Queen Victoria. Okay. Except, so, of course, she wasn't Queen Victoria then. Well, was no, she? all right. At the birth of the Princess Alexandrina Victoria. Who was not expected to be Queen, really, was she? Well, she sort of was at this. Well,. Not when she was born, maybe. Not when she was born, no. But not long after she was born. So what happened to sort of move her closer to right. the, the well, throne? Before she was born, mm. Princess Charlotte, who was the daughter of the Prince of Wales, yeah. um, died in 1817 yeah. after having a stillborn child. And she was actually married to Victoria's uncle Leopold. Right. So this has an influence on what happens later because of the way things went. So the, there were no other um, heirs who were born on the right side of the blanket, right. shall we say. No legitimate heirs. So there then became a mad rush for all of uh, the Prince of Wales's brothers to get married and have a baby so that they could provide an heir. Yeah. So the Duke of Clarence, who would go on to be William the Fourth, got married, and uh, Victoria's father, Duke of Kent, got married. And the, the Duke of Clarence's wife had two babies, but they both died. So Victoria ends up being the heir. Right. And very precious. And this is to do with her child, childhood, because she, um, she lived at Kensington Palace with her mother because her father died when she was less than a year old. <clears throat> Excuse me. And her mother protected her excessively because she was worried that one of her wicked uncles, as they were known, would try and bump her off because the Duke of Cumberland, who is the next brother in line had a son so they were worried he'd try and kill Victoria to, so that his son could come to the throne but this is a four part I guess you could call it mini series yes you? yeah it's based on the 1934 play written by Lawrence Houseman hmm. um, it wasn't actually shown in this country until June 1937 the play the play yeah. because the the um, Lord Chamberlain and who knew the Lord Chamberlain was still around doing plays and things because obviously you, you get the Lord Chamberlain in, in William Shakespeare's time saying what you can and can't not do yeah. but yeah he's he's there in 1937 and they they decide that it can't be shown until 100 years after Victoria's accession to the throne right. which was on the 20th of June 1937 now in 1937 this was a Sunday yeah. so they couldn't launch the play on a Sunday so it happens the next day <laughs> but th- this is um Episode one of this is the 13th of November, yes. 1964. And we should say it's Granada that makes it. Granada, from the north. From the north. With the yeah. re- 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 really poncy... Yeah, little flourishes. ...flowery yes. uh, logo, yes. which it's might the, amuse Martin Holmes. It's for the Queen, yeah, isn't, isn't it? it? And it stars Patricia Rutledge. It does, Routledge. Routledge. Yeah. Um, with, with a bit of a false nose. Yeah. And yeah. this is split into four episodes. It is. Spring, summer, autumn and winter. Yes. Looking at different periods of her life. Of her life. So yeah. we start off with her accession to the throne. And I, I will say, 
there is a reliance on the people watching it knowing their history mm. because you get the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Cunningham coming to tell us she's queen and then the next time you see her she's talking to Lord Melbourne who was her prime minister and it's two years later yeah and you don't know it's two years later. The only way well, you know it's two years later is because they start talking about her getting married. And she meets Albert. She's, she's obviously... Prince Albert was her cousin. And she had met him before. But she meets him properly again in 1839 and falls in love with him and asks him to marry her. But this is very, this is good for spotting actors yes, as well. Yes, it's got a very starry cast. Because episode yes. one's got Cyril Luckham Yes, as Lord it. Melbourne. Yeah, yes. uh, but it's also got Nic- Nicholas Courtney. Nicholas no Courtney less. pops up in a, a smallish role, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the episode one's, I think, in the worst state. Yes, the tapes it's terribly are, jumpy. Yeah, there, there's a load yes. of sort of off-locks and yes. things like that on the, on the yes. tape, but it's available from, from network. Yes. Um, and this whole thing about episode one, because the, the write-up, it says, is Victoria comes to the throne, mm. a choice of possible consorts is arranged, and Victoria proposes to Albert. Yes. Now, all this stuff about um, who is she going to marry, Yes. I didn't really know much about how they sort of arranged it. No. Well, as I mentioned, her uncle Leopold was married to Princess Charlotte. Yeah. When he lost his wife, obviously that was a horrible thing to happen, but he also lost his chance to be a sort of de facto king. Mm. So he then decided, when his his sister married the Duke of Kent and had Victoria, he then decided when Prince Albert was born that obviously Prince Albert, who is the son of his brother, his older brother, was the one for her to marry. So he spent the the whole of her life up to that point sort of steering her in that direction without her really realising it. So I, 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 I mean, she did fall in love with him, yeah. but I don't think there was much chance of her marrying anybody else, to be honest. But but th- this whole thing about... Um, look, it's, all, it's all cousins marrying, isn't yes. it, again? Yes. And it, because it, there's it, a very small pool of people who are of the right rank at that who time... Who are deemed suitable. ...suitable for her to marry. So it was always going to be somebody she was related to. But um, we come inevitably to um, sort of the royal diseases, don't we? Yes, um, yes. Because the the Duke of Saxe-Coburg, who was apparently yeah. Albert's father, yeah. he, there is this the haemophilia in the yeah. family. So they're, they're worried about getting... Him bringing haemophilia into the British royal family. I would point out that Victoria is the daughter of the Duke of Coburg's sister, so it's already in the family anyway. Yeah. But I suppose it doubles it up if you marry somebody else who has the inheritance. But this thing about um, Albert is possibly not his father's son, if you yes. see what I mean in yes. this, and I'd never mm. heard of this. No, I hadn't either. I, I first heard this um, a year or two ago, because obviously uh, ITV are now showing an up-to-date... Well, a more modern version of the story of Queen Victoria showing Jenna Coleman. Yeah. And there was a storyline a couple of years ago where Prince Albert is told by his uncle that he might possibly be his father because yeah. he and his mother comforted each other. <laughs> so who knows? Nobody will ever know if yeah. he was or not. But he was very unlike his father and his older brother. OK. But, I mean, Patricia Routledge has the... In an enviable task yes. of playing somebody through their entire life. Yes, yes. It's not something they do now because there is now, obviously, there's talk now of what happens when Jenna Coleman mm. is unable to carry on being Queen Victoria. When yeah. she gets to, in her in a couple a few years' time, and she's, they're, they're starting to show her in her 50s, do they get another actress in or do they attempt to make her up? Because they've done the same with The Crown. that They've had one actress play the Queen up until a certain point and then the next series sees um olivia coleman take on the role yeah so but do you think she gets away with playing her in episode one just about yeah just about she's playing her at 18 19 20 and yeah. it's considering she was 35 at the time she just about gets away with it okay i think the fact it's in black and white helps <laughs> But should we move on to episode two? Yeah, I, I would or... just mention as well, with episode one, because yeah. there are big leaps in the timeline, yeah. there's whole swathes of stuff that they don't show. Yeah. So there's the stuff that is like, um, there was a, a, a situation, it was called the bedchamber crisis, when um, Lord Melbourne's government lost a vote 
and he had to resign and the Tories were going to take over led by Sir Robert Peel and he came in and asked her to dismiss some of her ladies in waiting and she refused so he refused to form a government so Lord Belt Melbourne had to come back now this was unconstitutional she's not supposed to get involved in politics to that extent so it's at this point people start to all say she needs a husband (laughs) to sort her out and you also get the Lady Flora Hastings affair none of this is mentioned in episode one which is she's one of her mother's ladies in waiting and she believed that she was pregnant by her mother's controller of the household and she had in fact um, liver cancer but she put her through a undignified um, examination by her doctor to prove she was still a virgin which didn't endear her to the people at large which was only really resolved again when she married because everybody loves a wedding of (laughs) course but none of this is mentioned in the episode it's much more respectfully done yeah i should also mention the the way the end credits work as well because yes. it's very obvious with episode one yeah. that um, Albert yes, sort they of, just get him to stand still well, well the lights go down in yeah. the studio and he's, he he's, walks over to the side of yeah. the screen yeah and he, he's in the light and then you get a split screen effect where yeah. the credits come up on the right it's almost yeah. as though he's watching the credits it going up it is almost up. yeah and yeah. it did remind me of the Camberwick Grant clown Camberwick Green Clown. <laughs> like he's watching the end credit. Okay. It's, it, it, he doesn't actually sort of lean over and turn a handle, but it's, yes. it's, it's quite yeah. quite weird like that. Yes. Uh, Prince Albert's played by... Oh, see, I can't... Have we say it? Sorry. Well, it's not Joachim, it's not as Joachim. I would say it. it Joachim, isn't Joachim it? Joachim Hansen. Yeah. Yes. And his brother's played by... Uh, who's Prince Ernest? By Michael Wolfe yeah. from the Boom Base yeah. with a similar accent. Because he was expecting to marry her. He basically. was expecting to marry her. Yeah. But he, he had syphilis. He wouldn't have been a good husband. Okay. Episode 2, Summer. Yes. The morning after Victoria's wedding to Albert, and he mm-hmm. soon discovers that his role as Prince Consort requires patience, forbearing, and psychology. It's the beginning of his long struggle to be accepted in a country where he is still regarded as a foreigner. Guest starring Jenny Linden. Yes, she's a, a, a duchess. Yeah. I mean, oh, and. There is. It start. The episode starts with him shaving mm. in his room, and Victoria comes to watch him shave. <laughs> to watch him shave. But that is actually something she did the day, the day after they married because she didn't grow up with a father figure because her father had died. Yeah. So I suppose it was a bit of a novelty to watch somebody watch a man shave. You've, you've never come and watched my beard grow. Well, I don't need to come and watch it grow. It's growing all the time. <laughs> But, um, and I will point out, he's not actually Prince Consort at this point. He doesn't get the, um, the title Prince Consort until after the Great Exhibition, which is in 1851. Okay. He's her husband. He's not Prince Consort. Right. But you, you get this thing about um, what is his role, though, don't yes. you? But... And it's, yes, it's hard because she it's, it's hard in the same way that Prince Philip has had to adjust mm. to the fact that he always has to walk behind three paces behind the Queen. He's not allowed to walk with the Queen. He has to walk behind the Queen. And it's the same for Albert. Yeah. And it's very difficult because it's it's of the time that it's they're in, the man is always the head of the household. But he's not really the head of the household because she's the Queen, so she obviously outranks him. Because you've, you've had this thing in the, in the country that um, you had a succession of Georges, haven't yes. you? Yes. Um, and and all her uncles. So everybody's forgotten what it's like to have a queen. To have a really. queen. Well, the last queen is Queen Anne, and that's over a hundred years before. Yeah. And she possibly wasn't a very uh, successful queen. She's very much forgotten because she had no children. Well, she had children, but none of them survived. Yeah. So she had no heirs. So so you get this thing where um sort of it it's almost sort of unsaid that it's expected that Albert will like take her in. Yes, into, 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 hand. into hand, yes. isn't it? It becomes de facto king. Yeah. Um, quite quickly because she rapidly becomes pregnant. Yeah. And every time she's pregnant, she sort of gets... And she was pregnant a lot with Queen Victoria. She had nine children. Yeah. But every time she's pregnant, she gets sidelined a little bit and Albert takes over some of the responsibilities and he does become de facto king but you get this bit where he doesn't come home one night yes and he's gone off to he's gone to windsor yeah yeah is that like he's in a bit of a huff do you yes think? he gets yeah. he gets a bit of a huff because she sent for him but yeah. then it turns out that at windsor they were having a party they were having a party and he caught them out yeah yeah so maybe yeah because there, there appears to be a lot of stuff going on 
um, that she doesn't know about yes. in the household yeah. about sort of people yeah. ordering stuff yeah. for their own ends. Yeah. And that was the way it was. I mean, it's that was dealt with in the in the news, in the more modern series as well. Like, there's a lot of waste, and, and Prince Albert made himself very unpopular by coming in and and getting rid of all that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Episode three. Yes. Autumn. Yes. Victoria's attitude to writers, painters and poets at court becomes apparent. Mm -hmm. When the future King Edward VII rebels under parental discipline, Benjamin Disraeli becomes Minister in Attendance. Mm. Starring Geoffrey Chater, Hugh Cross and Maurice Colborne. Not that one. Yes. The other Maurice Colborne. Different Maurice Colborne. <laughs> but, uh, yes, you've and got... Max Adrian. Max Adrian with an amazing chin beard, yes. as I call and, it. And a, and a very obvious wig. Yeah. And possibly playing it in a way you won't be able to get away with these no. days. All I'm going to mention is Fagin. Okay. <laughs> that tells you all you really need to know. But this is the um, episode um, basically around um, Albert becoming ill eventually, yes. isn't it? And, and, yes. and dying. Because yes. isn't there the thing that she blamed... She blamed Prince... Edward. Edward. Well, uh, Bertie. Yeah. Yeah. Who becomes Edward the Seventh? Yeah, yes. for his death. For his death, because um, he was he was away. He he went to university and he didn't get on with that. He wasn't really the academic type, hmm. so they sent him off to join the army. And when he joined the army, he lost his virginity to an actress, yeah. which was a bit shocking. So Albert goes off, and Albert was quite upset by this. And Albert had very high standards for his eldest son, possibly too high of a standard. Any son could never, he could never live up to it. Because again, this is something they're doing in the modern series. There, mm. there was a, a scene in an episode a week or two ago, when last week's episode, where the young Prince Albert or Bertie says that Papa doesn't love me anymore because I'm stupid. Because yeah. they've had a phonologist in looking at the shape of his head, and he's, they oh, basically the said, yeah, that he's, he hasn't got a great intellect. <laughs> um, which is something Albert blames on her side of the family because obviously her grandfather George III was considered to be mad yeah okay so, but yeah so Albert had, went off to see him and they went for a long walk in the rain and he caught well it, they, they, the thing that they say he died of is typhoid fever there is a belief now that he, he'd actually had um, Crohn's disease for quite a long time right. and it was that that killed him because he'd been ill for a, a quite a long while before that but it happens all of a sudden and there's no sort of you don't get told what's happening he just suddenly he's sick yeah so again it relies on you knowing the history what led to that point yeah yeah, yeah. but there's a couple of bits that we wanted to mention in that because yeah. there's a bit where the the doctor comes in and he wants the window open yeah and well open the window open and the, then shut it yeah after in half an hour's time yeah. So they they play the scene and the nurse, the actress playing the nurse, goes over to shut the window and she can't shut it. Because the set stuck. seems to have jammed. Yeah. So she sort of struggles to shut it for a minute and then goes, oh, and walks off again. And sort of pretend, almost, it's not quite she <laughs> pretends she shut it, but at least there wasn't a line saying, I've shut the window. Yeah. Because <laughs> that... she just walks off. <laughs> and then the, the bit where he actually dies. Yes. Mm. How they shoot it is really weird, isn't yes. it? Yes. Or describe it. It's just a huge, big close-up. It's a big close-up of his sort of, well, the top half of him. Yeah, really. and then, then her face her comes face. in. Yes, and she does a silent she scream. She does a silent scream. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very, it's very but it's, weird. But yeah, the implication is you, you sort of see his hand go limp, and um, one of her daughters, Princess Alice, is in there. That's another thing they don't show. They don't show. They obviously didn't want to go to the expense or the awkwardness of having child actors. So the children are never seen at any time as children. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, she, she had rather lots. So they should have been there at some point. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you get the silent scream and it's, it's yeah, it's really quite effectively done. Yeah. So. Okay, episode mm. four. Yes. Winter. Mm -hmm. The imperious, contradictory Victoria flirts with her inseparable attendant, John Brown, and her, imposes her will upon the heads of the church at Windsor. Yes. Now, there's an extraordinary scene close to the start of this episode, because she's at Windsor Castle, mm. um, 
And well, actually, this, that's probably a bit later on because there's, there's a bit in Scotland as well. I was going to say, you've got there? the Scottish bit first. You've got the Scottish bit. And then you go to Windsor Castle and she's talking with a new, what, the wife of the new dean of, of, of Windsor. Yeah. And she's obviously a social reformer who is almost telling the Queen what she should be doing and how she should be yeah. doing it, which obviously doesn't go down well. And she decides after she's gone that she needs to send him off to Australia to get the woman as far away from possible from her. Yeah, well, let's just jump back to the to the Scottish bit yes. again, because mm-hmm. again, you you just suddenly get John Brown. You just get John Brown in it all of a sudden, yes. And yes. Um, and again, it relies on you knowing who John Brown is. And people probably know now through the like the Billy Connolly film. Film, yeah. but mm-hmm. again, w- w- was he that well known? Do you think? I don't know because. I don't know because after what did she, people know after yeah. she died? A lot of her diary entries and papers and letters were burned mm. to keep her reputation. Because um, because where does the Isle of Wight stuff fall at this point? Uh, the Isle of Wight stuff actually starts a lot earlier because Albert yeah. they, they 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 bought Osborne House um, in the eighteen forties, I think, yeah. and then he remodelled it from then point but she point spends long. a fair bit she of time she spends a fair there. amount of time there yeah yes. but you don't get any of that in the, no well in the that's play. if yeah. you can't keep getting too many different locations yeah. really but right. yeah and, and then you get this sort of meeting with the bishops yes. as well as you as you yes. get a, a, yeah. I was going to say a herd of bishops yeah um, apparently there's various different terms yeah. for a for bench of bishops a bench of bishops yeah. is my favourite one the idea of like bishops sitting on a bench yeah uh, but yeah, is she sort of? Um, what's, what's she got got them there for? Just she's to, sort of laying down the it, law because she doesn't want. I think it's something about the, it's getting some of it's getting too Catholic. All right, yeah. And also the the Church of Scotland, which is completely independent, and that's too Presbyterian. That's yeah. too the other way. I think she just wants them not to be. Yeah, it's, it's sort of. She doesn't want it to be too sort of, you know, um, masses and yeah. things like that. But by this point, they've really layered her in makeup. Yes, hasn't well, they? obviously, yeah. yeah, she's she's getting on now because it actually finishes. It doesn't go right up to her death. It finishes no. in a diamond on a diamond jubilee, which is um, eighteen ninety seven. Because she's sort of in the wheelchair. Yeah, at that being point. pushed around by yeah. various people. But right, right at the end, she does this sort of rather nice sort of sort of voiceover thing. She does. You, you sort of get inside her head, don't yes. you? Um, yeah. But I, I think it's a really interesting performance that it she is. gives, the, it having is. to show the, the full range of yeah. somebody's life. It is. Mm. And people only think of sort of Patricia Routledge as sort of a comedy actor yes. now. Yes, it's interesting to see her in a more serious role. Yeah. I mean, I say the only distracting thing, and it's more in the young, when she's playing the young Victoria, is the fact they've got, I don't know why, what is wrong with her nose, but they've got a <laughs> bit of a false nose on and it's slightly... You expect Obvious. him to start drooping under the yeah. studio lights or or something like that. But yeah, it's a very interesting performance, and it's it's amazing actually how many times Queen Victoria has been portrayed on screen. I think she only she's she, she's sort of tying up there with Henry the Eighth and Elizabeth I for most televised or or screen timed monarch yeah because you were trying to do the, the sums weren't yes. you about who's who's I, been portrayed i gave most. it up in the end because it's just too but, complicated but as you said there are there are some sort of kings and queens yeah. that just don't get any yes. sort of yeah. screen time at all which so is people weird. like james the first yeah uh or william and mary yeah or queen anne who's, yeah. who's come a bit more into focus recently with the film the favorite or sort of like george the second yeah sort of all these sort of or james the second yeah you yeah. know but that's the thing, you know. George the Third, yes, is I guess got a more interesting story yes. than like William the Fourth, yes. Because yeah. you know, if you were to ask me what William the Fourth did, and all I'd say he sort of sailed some boats, and that's about yeah. it. Well, he was, yeah, he was in the navy, and he had yeah. a lot of illegitimate children. All right, with his mistress before he married his wife, Queen Adelaide. Because we haven't really sort of covered sort of um, historical drama very no. much, have we? You know. No. Um, you know, we've done a lot of crime drama and things mm-hmm. like that, but it was interesting to actually sort of pick this one. It was. And again, yeah. why did you go for this adaptation? Um, I don't know. When network advertised they were selling it, and I'm, I'm always interested in stuff about sort of Queen Victoria and other, yeah. other modern, modern monarchs. So I got it, and then we, I thought, well, you know, 
I realised it was 200 years this month yeah. since she was born and I thought it'd be an interesting thing to look at because I think it's interesting the way they cover a show Queen Victoria in the 30s and in the 60s mm. and now because now they're showing her in, in the Jenna Coleman series as a much more independent modern forthright woman whereas mm. then they're showing her much more ruled by Albert. Which was the way it was. I mean, let's think about it. This is 1964. Yes. And, you know, the story is of Queen Victoria. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, inevitably, the lead character mm -hmm. is, is, you know, Patricia Routledge. Yes. And can you think of many sort of dramas around this time that are actually no. held by a woman or no. like, not like, like that? No. Uh, so, you know, it's it's quite... In, quite interesting to, 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 just to see the actual yes. just doing it yeah. just actually putting it on the screen but it's interesting to see that it's adapted by Peter Wildblood hmm. who um, obviously he does a lot of drama he does um, yeah. Crown Courts and things yeah. but he had gone to prison for a homosexual affair yeah. he got caught out so whether it's he wrote about this because I'm not saying he wrote about it because he was homosexual but whether he had no fears of writing about a strong woman. Mm. Okay, interesting. You know. Yeah, and I guess the fact that it's Granada. Yes. And Granada, um, you know, Coronation Street. Yes, that's full of strong women it, at this it, point as yeah, well. So, Nina Sharples. Yeah, and... it, it's just you know I don't know whether we're trying to make too many connections here. Possibly. But yeah. If if you told me about this series, I I would have assumed it was a BBC series. Yes, you, see. you would assume so because the, the BBC are known for their costume yeah. dramas. You know, like we've got some of the late fifties sort of Dickens things, like Bleak House and yes. things like that. It does feel quite like that. It does. Yeah, it does. Yes. Um, but yeah. except for the lack of, you know, spontaneous compu combustion <laughs> of various characters. An old man stepped. Old man stepped over mostly, but, <laughs> but yeah, but it's... yeah. But Victoria's life is a very interesting because it covers such a huge period of time. It covers virtually the whole of the 19th century and so much changes and happens during her lifetime. And it's interesting to see that, um, again, this was mentioned in the modern series, that about her overtaxing her intellect, yeah. which is outrageous. <laughs> and it's this assumption that because George III was considered to be insane then it might have passed down the generation yeah. so every time she was slightly irrational it was that coming it out it was yeah. that coming out yeah. and made me know it's not the fact that you're tre you're treating her like a child yeah. or a silly girl or a, a hysterical pregnant woman yeah you know? none of which is actually shown in this series because it's a different type of series but it's it's a very good part for somebody it must have been quite mm. enjoyable for Pusha Shiratlos to play because it's you know it's to do all of that 60 years or more of, of somebody's life yeah. so you know from a young girl to an old woman okay so, well thank you for that Lisa okay. that's a, interesting to look at and yes. that's this issue pretty much wrapped up then it isn't is. it yes so we'll say thank you to everyone for yes, listening thank you and thank you for everybody for contributing that's 35 we've clocked up yes, now yes gosh oh, blimey mm. we're going to have to start uh planning some more now aren't yes we? we are but we've got we've got plans in various stages for future issues we'll so we're, we're not going anywhere no. no so again we'll say thank you for listening and see you in episode 36 okay bye 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 was episode 35 of Round the Archives. Starring Lisa Parker, Andrew Trowbridge, Warren Cummings, Paul Chandler, Nick Goodman and Martin Holmes. On the musical side you had Dan Tate and Paul Chandler. The script for Survivors The Fourth Horseman was by Terry Nation. And the producer was Terence Dudley. <laughs>